May 18, 1969. We were almost ready. Man had orbited the moon once. Man had test flown the lunar module, the lunar landing craft, in Earth orbit once. But before we would commit men to a lunar landing, there were still a number of things to be worked out. This was the mission of Apollo 10. In the words of its commander, Tom Stafford, to sort out all the unknowns and pave the way for a lunar landing. It was a veteran crew Spacecraft Commander Tom Stafford had flown on Gemini 6 and 9. Lunar Module Pilot Gene Cernan had flown with Stafford on Gemini 9. John Young had been on Gemini 3 and Gemini 10. They would face problems on Apollo 10, problems that would be solved for Apollo 11. Most would be minor, but they would be solved. Stafford, Young, Cernan. They brought to their mission enthusiasm, dedication, responsibility, even amazement. And through the means of color television, they took us with them as they played their part in man's greatest adventure. We are go for a mission to the moon at this time. Tom Stafford reports they are go. We're coming up on the 22nd mark. T minus 20 seconds and counting. 17 seconds and counting, guidance internal. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on, 5, 4, 3, 2. All engines running. Launch commit, liftoff. We have liftoff 49 minutes past the hour. on the second stage. Man, that staging was quite a sequence. Just like old time, it's beautiful out there. You guys sound ecstatic. Man, this is the greatest journey. Apollo 10 was headed for its initial parking orbit around the Earth. After the checkout in orbit, it was time for TLI, Translunar Injection, the burn of the S-4B engine to send Apollo 10 to the moon. Uh, Roger, 10, uh, you're dope for TLI, uh, S4B's looking as planned. Right on. Sleeko! Roger, Sleeko. We confirmed the cutoff. Apollo 10, with a perfect burn, was on its way to the moon. Now, the command and service module separated from the S4B and turned around to dock with the lunar module. For the first of many times, Tom Stafford turned on the small, high-resolution color television camera and shared with the people of Earth the spectacular sights of outer space. Apollo 10 took along all those who had made and were making the conquest of the moon a reality. Charlie, we can't be more than about five, ten feet away. Roger. Uh, Ken, it's looking real stable to us. We show you closing finally. Be docked in a second, I hope. Roger. Uh, Ken, uh, Houston, uh, you're looking good. We can see the uh, markings in the rendezvous with it. It looks like you just docked. Roger, How are you got a capture. You haven't fired yet. Roger. Snap, snap, and we're there. Got two grays. Roger. You saw the docket, Charlie. Gene, we can re read the uh, numbers on the lamb right, uh, docking window. During the docking, Apollo 10 encountered its first problem. The mylar containing the insulation on the spacecraft hatches had broken, releasing a snowstorm of fiberglass in the zero gravity. Hey, 
and we're going to have a heck of a cleaning job here. They had insulation all in the seal, all in the valve, and it's really a heck of a mess up here. For Apollo 11, it would be fixed. Then we watched as they pulled free of the S-4B and got our first live color pictures of the blue planet Earth. Charlie, this is, it, 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 uh, it's so hard to describe. You can go right up past Alaska and you can see the polar caps. Uh, it, it's incredible. Well, we see it all here, Gene. Its uh, colors are really beautiful. That's great. And, and the blackest black that you ever could conceive is the setting for all this. Right. So Stafford, Young, and Cernan began their coast away from Earth, their speed continually dropping as the arms of Earth's gravity tried to pull them back. To control the temperature of the spacecraft, they performed a slow, steady rotation. Yeah, it sounds like shortly we'll soon be about 55,000 miles out, huh? Yeah, that's right. Sounds like a long way from home, Joe. It was time to continually check the trajectory and the spacecraft. The command module, call sign Charlie Brown. The lunar module, Snoopy. It was time for conversation. And it was time for showing the people at home on the Earth what space travel is like. And I do for one time, you have your choice. If you don't like things right side up, you can go upside down. I just do whatever he says. Uh, Roger, down here. <laughs> okay, we got one of you in each direction. That's the only way to fly. Farther and farther from Earth, Stafford, Young, and Cernan flew on their wingless flight. Now, off the rotating home planet, day and night became only a progression of minutes as the spacecraft rotated at three revolutions an hour. We're about to finish that uh, ambulance thing and we're going to sock out. Today and tomorrow we should be around the moon. Right. concentrate on finishing things that you have already started. Today's pace will be moderate. Use this time to take inventory. John Young, you will have a slow day today. This will give you time to concentrate on the work ahead. You will enjoy your surroundings and companions. And uh, Gino, your horoscope reads, give careful thought to your working and driving habits. Do something nice for your friends. The crew of Apollo 10 was getting ready for lunar orbit. Checklists gone over, clocks synchronized, computers updated. As the time for the lunar orbit insertion burn neared, the men in mission control concentrated on their displays. Houston, Apollo 10, uh, just tried looking out as far as I can out of the top hatch window, still can't see the moon, but we'll take your word if it's there. Over. It's there plus 60 miles. No guarantee on that. Apollo 10, Houston, uh, two minutes to LOS. Uh, everybody here says Godspeed. Okay, and we'll see you right on the other side in orbit. Uh, Roger. LOS, loss of signal. The burn to place the spacecraft into lunar orbit would take place behind the moon, out of contact with Earth. Later, a second burn would make the orbit circular, 60 miles above the moon. The flight controllers waited for AOS, acquisition of signal. We have AOS. Hello, Apollo 10, Houston, over. Uh, Roger, Houston, Apollo 10, you can tell the world that we have arrived. How's the uh, view, 10? Charlie, it might sound corny, but the view is really out of this world. For the second time, three Americans orbited the moon. The electronic senses of MISFIN, the manned spaceflight network, followed their flight, measuring precisely their orbital path, information vital to the success of the first manned landing. 
On the first orbit, the crew turned the TV camera on the scarred lunar landscape. See the sea of crisis up here. That's the first real thing I'm positive of that I've seen that I recognize. And boy, it really uh, stands out. Stafford Young Cernan, a quarter of a million miles from Earth, 60 miles above our desolate satellite. Boy, that's, this is really a rugged planet. But also looking out at the horizon and some of the mountains we can see down here, that's going to be a real kick tomorrow down at 50,000 feet. Over. Uh, we copy that. Hello, Houston Apollo 10. We've got a beautiful view of the Earth here, but it's absolutely fantastic. Now it was time for Lunar Module pilot Gene Cernan to crawl into the Lunar Module called Snoopy to check it out for the next day's descent. His evaluation? And I personally am very happy with the fella and I hope we can give you as good a report tomorrow. You bet your life. Hey, you watch Snoopy well tonight and uh, make him sleep good and we'll take him out for a walk and let him stretch his legs in the morning. Oh, okay. The next day, Stafford and Cernan were in the lunar module. John Young in the command module called Charlie Brown. They checked out Snoopy for the last time. One of the items involved venting the tunnel connecting Snoopy and Charlie Brown to make sure that the spacecraft hatches did not leak.